can you hear me? Okay. Yes, yes. Is Jessica in already? Still not. I believe Ms. Jan is going to get in. Okay, Jessica is in now. It looks like it. Sorry, Professor. Sorry. I don't know why he keeps Sorry. kicking me out. Yeah. It doesn't like you. It doesn't like me. <laughs> All right, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right, so let's skip over. Like I said, the reason again for thyroid cancer is this will be taken up next semester under cancer in your fifth semester. And as far as management, because this is surgical, uh, surgically treated, uh, removing the, the tumor as well as the thyroid gland itself. So the patient will have the same pre and post-op care as with what we discussed under thyroidect um, thyroidectomy for hyperthyroidism. Let's go now to the other glands. Now these four other glands are attached anteriorly and posteriorly on the thyroid gland. So chances are when a patient undergoes thyroidectomy, these are also removed because you can't really leave them out because they are attached to the thyroid gland. So if you remove the thyroid gland, where are they going to go? Make sense? Okay. Although with subtotal thyroidectomy, they can be preserved. However, they are prone to be injured in, um, in, the, in, in every thyroidectomy surgery. Besides thyroidectomy, there are other causes that can lead to hypoparathyroidism. Uh, namely, we have uh, autoimmune diseases. We also have tumors. Or it could also be just like hypo and hyperthyroidism, they could also be uh, caused by an autoimmune disorder. There's only one function of the parathyroid glands because they only secrete one hormone, which is the parathyroid hormone, or it's also known as the parath hormone. They have one job, which is to raise serum calcium levels. How does it do that? it will secrete the parathyroid hormone, which increases bone resorption, otherwise known as it will break down calcium from the bone. That's how it raises calcium levels. And as we've learned last week, the third hormone coming from the thyroid gland is calcitonin, which was on the quiz today. So there's only one problem in hypoparathyroidism, which is hypocalcemia. So long story short, we will be dealing with a patient here with low serum calcium levels and all the consequences that, that result from that. So let's review a little bit. So what does calcium do for you? So calcium, just like any other electrolyte, potassium, sodium, magnesium, all electrolytes excite cells, meaning they stimulate cells. It's just a matter of which cells are they going to stimulate more. Calcium is the major cation in cardiac, skeletal, and also smooth muscle contractions. Smooth muscles are referring to the GI tract as well as your blood vessels. Again, major tissues or organs that depend on calcium are cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscles. Smooth muscles, again, include blood vessels. So that will include capillaries, arteries, and veins. Manifestations, of course, these will be consistent with low calcium levels. So what are, let's review again, what are signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia? So just bear in mind ca cardiac, skeletal, and smooth muscle contractions. Look at the resulting signs and symptoms if there is low serum calcium. What do you notice on the symptoms? 
namely numbness, tingling around the mouth, hands or feet, uh, severe muscle cramps, spasms of the hands and feet. What's the pattern here? What's happening to the cells if your serum calcium is low, meaning it's low in the bloodstream? So by ratio, if you look at the ratio here, if it's low in the bloodstream, it must be high intracellularly. Make sense? Meaning by ratio, just by ratio, it's higher compared to the, uh, it's higher intracellularly compared to extracellularly. What's, what's the, what's happening to the patient if the calcium is low? Is there under-stimulation of the cells or is there over-stimulation? Look at the pattern. There seems to be oh, an over-stimulation, right? So the, oh. the muscles, be it cardiac, skeletal, or smooth muscles, become very irritable, resulting in cramps and spasms. You can also say the same uh, in, in the case of the GI symptoms, which is not listed here, since they are low, so therefore it will result in lower peristalsis. Peristalsis will be slow, resulting in constipation, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension. The complete list is, remember the uh, electrolyte chapter under fluid electrolytes? The complete list is over there. For laboratory, we will uh, do the total calcium, which is the first column there. That's referring to total calcium, 8.2 to 10.2. Uh, obviously, that's decreased in hypoparathyroidism and then increase in hyperparathyroidism. When we say ionized calcium, I think somebody asked me this last week under thyroid gland. Who was it that asked about free T4, T3, T4? Me. Me. Yeah. Okay, so this is the same. So when we when we say ionized calcium, this is the free calcium. Free calcium, ionized calcium is the same thing. This is the calcium that is not bound to anything. Calcium, as in total calcium, includes calcium chloride, which is found in the bone. Whereas when we say ionized calcium, this is the free calcium that is coming in and out of the cells, coming in and out of cardiac, skeletal and smooth muscle cells. We include magnesium and phosphorus here, specifically phosphorus, because they are opposite. If you look at the pattern, if calcium is low in hypoparathyroidism, look at the level in hypoparathyroidism in, in for phosphorus, it's increased. So therefore, you will never see a situation wherein calcium and phosphorus are going in the same direction. They will always be opposite, right? Because they can't exist in the same compartment. Make sense? So keep that in mind later when we talk about diet. Because in hypocalcemia, of course, that would tell you just like in hypothyroidism, we replace the hormone, right? or in this case, we will replace the calcium. However, make sure that the calcium food that you are advising the patient to eat doesn't have high phosphorus content because that will be counterproductive. What is the significance of vitamin D here? Why is it included? All right. We cannot, there's no way for us to absorb calcium unless we get vitamin D. Here are manifestations of Chivostex and Chosocyan, um, referring to tetany. And here is a warning for, uh, for tetany. This was already mentioned under thyroidectomy last week. So after thyroidectomy, because we're anticipating severe hypocalcemia, we what equipment should we have at the bedside? Tracheostomy tray, what else? Oxygen. You need an oxygen. And one more. In order for suction. you to perform a suction. Okay, very good. So we need oxygen, suction, and a tracheostomy tray.
how do we diagnose it? Of course, we draw calcium levels in addition to the clinical manifestations being presented by the patient. Next is, what do we do about it? So the patient has severe hypocalcemia. Treatment will be, of course, to raise calcium levels. We will be giving calcium chloride. Calcium chloride, calcium gluconate. Um, we will also include vitamin D. Uh, that will be calciparol. I think there's a... No, there's no table. Okay, uh, let's just keep it here. Uh, please bear in mind the difference here. So look, you, you see the statement right here under chronic hypothyroidism. The uh, treatment is oral calcium with vitamin D. For acute episodes of hypocalcemia, uh, we do supplement it with IV, IV calcium gluconate or IV calcium chloride. Patient will always be on a cardiac monitor though when, when this happens. Because what is always the consequence when you treat one disorder in, in any endocrine problem? As you saw last hyper, week, hyper. all right, it will be the opposite, right? We treated hypo, hyperthyroidism, the patient became hypothyroid, and then vice versa. When we were while we were treating hypothyroidism, patient could potentially develop hyperthyroidism. Same exact thing here. Here's a summary of our signs and symptoms. I won't test you on the EKG effects yet because we haven't finish module 8. Uh, after we do module 8, these are now free game. I can now test you on ECG um, waves and complexes changes. I'm referring to T wave, QT changes, um, but, but that's later after module 8. So for the second exam, uh, I won't test you on those yet because I, it's not fair yet. Okay, we, we haven't finished um, module 8 yet. But everything else, the muscle cramps, spasms, tingling, paresthesias, seizures, uh, except the ECG changes. Here are our interventions. Again, it, it, it is uh, to replace calcium levels please see the difference between acute and chronic hypocalcemia. And here's cardiac monitoring, as already mentioned. Now, magnesium will also be checked because if you look at the pattern back to the labs, what can you say about calcium and magnesium? Are they opposite or do they go together? They go together. So if calcium drops, so does magnesium and vice versa. So if it's up, magnesium is also up. Phosphorus is the one that's opposite. So therefore, if the patient has hypomagnesemia, then the patient definitely will have hypocalcemia at the same time. Any question on hypoparathyroidism? Are the effects going to be in hyper, hyper what was that bello i said um like, I said, um, like hypothyroidism hypo would it would the effect be inverse as well um your audio was really broken say more slowly no, i said like when said, like, we, um, hypo and hypothyroidism are the effects effective? the opposite as well um, you mean when we go to hyper? Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. It will be opposite. And as I already mentioned here, signs of hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia because while we were we are treating hypocalcemia here, patient may develop hypercalcemia. So you'll be teaching them signs and symptoms of both. Here's what I mentioned about nutrition earlier. So when you're supplementing nutrition, you're, you're treating hypocalcemia with nutrition therapy, make sure the foods are 
high in calcium but must be low in phosphorus. We'll get to that box later when we get to um, um, the next pages. Box 43.1 will be um, in, in a separate page. This time let's do hyperparathyroidism. So this is the exact opposite. We were dealing with hypocalcemia. This time we are dealing with hypercalcemia. These are some of the associated causes. It's typically a common problem in chronic kidney disease. Here is box 43.1. I'll be testing you only from this box for uh, the nutrition, right? Because we're not trained to be nutritionists. So uh, to be fair, I'll use box 43.1 for the exam. Uh, please make sure you know what are soy products though. So give me examples of soy products. What is made of soy? Tofu? <laughs> yeah, genius. Yeah, Soybeans. Of course, yeah, that's, that's where soy come from. Okay, that's from soybean. <laughs> what are examples of soy products? Well, uh, tofu. Soy milk. A tofu is from soy. Yeah, soy milk. That's soy. What else? Um, tempe. What? Miso tempe. Yeah, miso. That uh, soup. Japanese. You know when you get a bent. Yeah, when you get a bento box, they give you miso soup. Yep. Say again. Tofu, yeah, and soy milk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tofu would be the most common. I mean, um, The edamame beans. Yeah, I, I don't really eat a lot of it. I mean, I eat it if it's available, but um, it's not like I really seek out tofu. Let's have some tofu for dinner. Wait, or, or some soy products. Do they have chunks over there? Veggie chunks? Do they have what? Veggie chunks. Veggie chunks? I don't know. But I know they make some artificial meat you know, plant-based meat uh, made of tofu. They, they also do that. Yeah, like the... Um, yeah, veggie burgers. They, they have tofu. Okay. So in hyperparathyroidism, so where did this calcium come from? Because the patient has hypercalcemia. So obviously because of the high levels of parathyroid hormone, there will be increased breakdown of calcium from the bone. Uh, obviously, that will lead to bone loss. Um, so this patient will be at risk for fractures. So let's go now to your signs and symptoms. So it'll be the opposite. Look at the manifestations resulting from hypercalcemia. So now you have polyuria, anorexia, constipation, and then for muscle symptoms, you have muscle weakness. In neuro, you have lethargy, confusion, fatigue, and generalized bone pain. This is obviously because you're breaking down calcium from the bone. Diagnosis, of course, serum, <coughs> calcium levels, total and pre-calcium, magnesium, phosphorus will be drawn. Treatment. So this is opposite. We have high calcium. We have to lower the calcium level this time. There are two ways to do this. One is to eliminate calcium and 
another way is to return calcium back where it came from. Meaning instead of uh, the, the original problem wherein you had increased osteoclastic activity, which is bone resorption, now we're going to increase the osteoblastic activity, which is now we're returning the calcium back into storage in the bones and the teeth. So let's go with excretion first. So for as far as excreting calcium, we will increase fluid intake. That can be accomplished by mouth or IV fluids. At the same time, we will also be giving diuretics, particularly um, loop diuretics. There's a warning here for thiazide diuretics because this can actually cause reabsorption of calcium in the bone. So you can use loop uh, diuretics, but not thiazide diuretics. We will also avoid all other cost, uh, sources of calcium, like Tums, for instance, which is a common antacid. And we'll also decrease vitamin D. Here is our uh, summary. Again, all the other signs and symptoms except the ECG changes. Kidney stones. Let's say urethral stones are all possible. Um, nobody asked me why we're giving fluids and diuretics at the same time. Isn't that kind, kind of counterproductive? Overloading. Not overloading, but kind of counterproductive, right? You're giving fluids and then you're giving um, diuretics at the same time. Did you think about that? Because you don't want to keep them in a balance? Actually, it's not. The uh, both both interventions will help excrete uh, calcium. In the case of IV fluids, because we're giving a lot here, we're giving fluid boluses of normal saline. Let's say one five hundred to one thousand mLs per hour. So the purpose of this is to flush calcium out. Plus, the rapid infusion of fluids will actually cause a dilution of um, the bloodstream, lowering calcium levels immediately because the diuretic here will take about <clears throat> 30 minutes to an hour to work. So if you need to drop calcium levels fast, then your, your first intervention would be to give uh, large volumes of IV fluids. Normal saline. So here's your fluid increase. Um, that will also help decrease uh, stones. Here's the rationale right here, another rationale. So here's your loop diuretic. This one will definitely help you excrete cal uh, calcium. What else will it excrete though? It, will it only excrete calcium? Potassium, Potassium and Potassium. a little bit of sodium as well. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you give oral phosphates, definitely this, if you give phosphate, then that means you will eliminate calcium. Uh, here's your protection from injury, protect the patient from uh, fractures, so fall precautions. If the patient has symptoms of a kidney stone, make sure you strain the urine. This is for diagnostic purposes. That way the doctor is aware whether or not the patient passed any stones. And just like with hypocalcemia, we will teach again both because our interventions has the potential to lead to the other extreme problem. And obviously the calcium is already high, so we do low calcium diet. And here again is the increasing fluids. Remember the patient does have constipation uh, it with hypercalcemia. And that's it. Any question on hyper and hypothyroidism? Parathyroid. Okay, let's take a short break. Come back at one.
140. 140.